For nearly 50 years, Carew International has helped companies grow by building customer-centric, high-performance sales and leadership cultures that are well-prepared to navigate dynamic business environments. Carew's training programs inspire dramatic, lasting performance improvement, instill agility to successfully navigate dynamic environments, and create competitive advantage. As the CEO and owner of Carew, Jeff Seely is dedicated to elevating the learning and development industry, enhancing business performance, and improving organization growth through impactful learning. This commitment is one of the many reasons he is excited about being here today to share his insights and perspective on building effective leaders. Hello, and welcome to today's Training Industry Leader Talk. Building Effective Leaders, sponsored by Carew International, ELB Learning, GP Strategies, Hemsley Fraser, Open Sesame, and Torch. I'm Dee Caraglino, your event producer and host for today. Before we dive into our next session, I would like to quickly go over a few housekeeping items to help you interact with our speakers and get the most out of today's sessions. This will be an interactive session, so throughout the event, please feel free to put your comments into the chat window and submit questions in the Q&A window. We'll be monitoring those comments and answering your questions throughout the session. I've enabled closed captions for this event, and you can turn those on or off by locating the closed caption icon in your toolbar. We also encourage you to share the information you receive today with your colleagues and network via social media. At the end of your time with us, you'll notice a short survey pop open in your browser, and we'd appreciate your thoughts on today's event. And lastly, all of our sessions are being recorded and will be archived on trainingindustry.com. You'll receive a follow-up email from us with a link to the on-demand sessions and presentations and any other materials. If this is your first training industry event, we'd like to welcome you. Training industry exists to make connections among learning and development professionals. We offer tons of resources to support your role in L&D through live events like today's Leader Talk, as well as through articles on our website, our magazine, conferences, research reports, and our podcast. Make training industry your go-to resource for learning solutions and visit trainingindustry.com to learn more. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Seeley. He is CEO and owner of Carew International. His leadership focuses on skill development, ensuring ROI for clients, and upholding Carew's reputation. Jeff earned his under, undergraduate degree from Central Michigan University and holds his MBA from the University of Michigan. His vast experience and in innovation fuel his commitment to sales excellence, leadership, and organizational development, positioning him as a pivotal figure in Carew International's client solutions. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Dee. It's a pleasure to be here as always and talk about leadership, my favorite thing in the world to talk about, quite honestly. Um, and so we're going to talk today a lot about the journey from manager to leader. And what that really means is, is if we think back even you know, 10, 15 years ago, when people were in a more of a manager position, they were responsible for a lot of different things. And what I'm going to really talk about now as we transition into the future with this multi-generational workforce, that leadership is becoming more critical than ever. And that is what we're going to really kind of focus on. So with that, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, this that good afternoon, except for if you're in the West Coast, it's still morning. So we'll kind of start walking through what we talk about. And let's kind of start with the whole concept of leadership versus management. And when you think about what that means is something simple, simply this. Managers tend to maintain the status quo. They monitor results. Uh, they look at inputs, outputs. They provide feedback. They make sure the goals are set. And they resource allocate. Those are the things that happen on a, on a regular basis. Um, but that's kind of now the entry level. Leadership really is what our teams are thirsting for. And leaders really help their teams and associates exceed their team and individual expectations. And a lot of times that isn't even what they think is possible. They inspire and they innovate. Uh, they develop both the human and the professional. And as we look at the, the, the future, you know, how we develop our human skills becomes even critical. They drive team results. And ultimately, which I think is one of the more important things, is they use emotional intelligence to really build relationships. And as we go forward, that's what we're going to kind of focus on. So I like to kind of start with this. A leader is really harnesses the power of transference. And what transference is, this helps motivate us to go to places that we would never otherwise go or even recognize. And they're needed to both change 
organizations and produce results almost in any business climate, but also more importantly, they create competitive advantage for the company. And people, as we look to the future, people are gonna become truly the competitive advantage. If you think about whatever organization you're in, you may have a competitive advantage for a period of time, but you know every competitor out there is doing everything they can to try to figure out how to overcome that competitive advantage. And once they do, what becomes the differentiation? It's the team that's interfacing with the customer, creating the customer experience, creating the workplace experience, creating your organization's experience, experience internally and externally. That's what this power of transference does and creates really amazing results for both people. I'd also like to, to start by this. A lot of times, and you know, I'm kind of older, so I remember when my boss used to come and just yell at me. And I wasn't very good at my job, so I got yelled at a lot. But I used to think sometimes, wow, I'm I'm really doing something wrong here. And I found this, you know, quick little graphic that says basically if someone treats you badly, just remember there is something wrong with them, not you. Normal people don't go around destroying other people. And unfortunately, we all sometimes have managers who feel like th their way to success is by changing the game and bringing other people down with them as opposed to lifting. And so that to me is critical to a leader. It's someone who lifts others around them. And that becomes part of what I wanna talk about today. So I'd like to kind of start with a simple poll question. And what percentage of employees are willing to go the extra mile for a manager or a leader. And this excludes managers in the top 30% of performance. So if you kind of take into consideration the you know, top 30% performing managers. So I'm talking about the bottom 70%, so to speak, which is a pretty large number. If you think about a normal bell curve distribution of managers, 30% is really at the tail end of the best managers in the world. So this encompass, encompasses everyone below that, that 30%. So if you kind of think about it, what you know? What are willing? What chances are employees willing to go the extra mile? So is it greater than sixty percent, fifty percent, thirty-three, or uh, or less than thirty-three percent? So if you take a moment, go ahead and you know vote on this a little bit. And as as you're doing that, I'm going to kind of continue to talk a little bit about this whole going the extra mile. And as all of us know that the, the reality is simply this, that if people won't follow you even out of morbid curiosity, it's really hard to be a leader. And if you don't have people willing to go forward with you, um, even out of that curiosity, it's really difficult to rally a team. And so I kind of start with this to kind of get a sense of what people are thinking. And Basically, it's interesting, 49% of you have said less than 33% of the time. Um, you know, so kind of an interesting you know, dichotomy if you look at 33 to 49, so less than 50% of the time of the people in we're talking to right now, almost 90% of you, 89% of you have basically said at 50, less than 50% of the time would that happen. Well, let's kind of take a look at what we found when um, the Zanger Folkman uh, did some analytics back in August of 22. And what they found was is less than 33% of the time people will, you know, will follow a manager or go the extra mile. And in fact, that number is actually closer to the raw data of 28% of the time. Here is the most astounding fact when I looked at this research is up to 87% of the time in managers who are in the you know, bottom 80%, employees or associates view them as basically neutral to not working at all. So if you think about that for a second, if you are not endearing your organization and getting them to rally around you as a leader, almost 87% of the time, the best they're doing is putting in their time the worst that's happening is they're you know, working against you. Basically, what we like to call quit in place. And quit in place is something that is almost more dangerous to any organization than any even underperforming. 
it basically says, I am not going to do anything other than just put my time in and do nothing to help the organization. And the power of that, if you really look at it from a leadership perspective, it's really all about influence. And someone had mentioned in the chat about John Maxwell. I'm a big fan of John Maxwell's. But it's truly, John Maxwell talks about leading. Leading is about talking to people in a way that makes them go that extra mile, that transference. So let's talk a little bit about how we shift our mindset. And as managers to go to leaders, we have to kind of figure out that basically 70% of our teams are neutral to quit, to quiet quitting, which is terrible. Quiet quitting, as I talked about, is a terrible situation. But quiet quitting isn't about bad employees. It's about bad bosses. People don't quit themselves. No one wakes up in the middle of the morning and says, oh, you know, I think today's going to be a really crappy day because I'm going to so underperform. Um, I'm just not feeling up to it. There isn't a human in the world that wakes up and says that's what they're going to look at. So it's really, you know, as we move into this leadership role, um, almost all of us automatically fall into that 70% category because the team may not know us or we may be, you know, being promoted or maybe coming from outside the organization or another area of the organization. So our team almost automatically puts us into that 70% category. And it's really not just a mere title change. Leadership is transformation and transformation is your mindset and your approach and your teams. And I've highlighted and your teams. That's the most critical piece of this is what is your team doing? How are they anticipating you? What are they doing? And that becomes part of how you have to shift your mindset. Uh, I know a couple of you, you know, heard I went to Michigan. Bo Schembechler, a longtime coach go, used to talk about the team, the team, the team. To this day, I still like to think of leaders. And even when I'm involved in leadership, it's the team, it's the team, it's the team. It's not me, it's them. And how do we get there? So let's talk about some behaviors um, that really are important in leading. And, you know, it comes down to this is, you know, as the leader, you um, have to have a couple really consistent areas. One, you have to have positive relationships with your direct reports, and you have to have likability. Likability is, is someone interested, are you interested in someone and are they interested in you? It doesn't mean you have to be best friends and you're going out for dinner or beers or having a lot of after work social things. It means that you're respected. You respect your team members, they respect you. It's engagement. And engagement is, is how are you engaging with the team? Are you just saying, here's what we do and here's how we do it? Is, or is it, how are we doing this? And we're gonna talk about some key elements of what that means in the future. And then finally, uh, you know, in that relationship area, it's what are our common interests and, and common ground? And, you know, our common ground may not necessarily be personal, but we have common interests and common ground around our organization around our success, around their success, more importantly. And if we want them to be successful, most people, as I said, want to be successful. So that becomes a part of how we look at it. So if you think about um, moving into that leadership role, especially if you're replacing someone who was either highly liked and, and highly respected because they were promoted or the opposite, which is they were you know, moved on because of underperforming uh, situations, it's our job to figure out how do we apply and change this game. And the first piece of this is quite honestly, uh, is that relationship. The second piece is trust and consistency. And that is one, are you, do you have honesty and transparency with your team? And two, do you deliver on your promise? The things that you say you deliver on. That helps create uh, what we're going to talk about in a little bit, an interdependent relationship. And then lastly, it's expertise. And it's not expertise in knowing everything in what you're doing. It's more as, as you're thinking up to date. Are you understand the latest business trends? Do you understand the latest market trends? Do you understand what's going on in the competition within your business? And you know, do your team and your colleagues and advisors trust your advice and opinions? 
In other words, I think back to many years of my career uh, as a younger you know, person and not in a leadership role, how many times you know, we would be sitting around the campfire, so to speak, and saying to ourselves and to others, boy, I just, I don't really trust what they say. I just, I don't think they know what they're talking about. And they always have their opinion and their opinion is always the right opinion. They're really not interested in anything any of us have to say. Those are the elements of a manager, not a leader. And so uh, someone mentioned in the chat, it is true, self-awareness. How do you rate yourself on these things? And you know, how do you deliver on your promise to what you talk about? So those are the things as we kind of think about those three you know, behavior elements of leading. Let's talk about what leadership is and what leadership is not. And I'd like to start with the leadership is not. Leadership is not a popularity contest. It's not about power. It's not about showmanship. It's not about short-term results or wisdom in long-range planning. Those are manager functions or ego-driven functions. Leadership is the accomplishment of a goal through the direction of human assets. And human assets are what help us meet our goals and how we derive success as an organization, as a leader, and for each other. Uh, a leadership is someone who successfully marshals our collaborators to achieve a particular end. How well do we collaborate the rest of the resources in the organization as well as our team? Are we bringing all those things together in a way that makes sense? And do we know how to bring it together? Uh, I like to, to follow football. And as many of you probably are, are familiar with a guy named Messi, I consider one of the greatest players ever to play the game of football. Well, Messi understands when to play defense, when to pass the ball, when to score, that's what a great leader does. Who do I need to involve? How do I need to involve them? And how do I get to that end of, of winning? And then lastly, a leader is someone who can say day to day, year after year, that we perform and we're going to do these things in a wide variety of circumstances. There's a consistency there. There's a deliverable there to their team, which then functions in getting good results. That's leadership. As you can see, somebody did mention, I do have my, my dog in my office with me, so she's wandering around a little bit. So hopefully she's not too distracting, but she's actually the smarter of the two of us in the, in the building here right now. So let's talk about the key component of leadership. Um, a couple of key components. One, innovation, and, and we'll talk about each one of these individually. Inspiration, um, and how we inspire, how we navigate change, how we develop our team and how we connect and engage. So those are some, some specific things I wanna talk about. So let's talk about innovation first off. The biggest limiting factor to innovation is fear because our brain is programmed to be creative. But when we switch that fight or flight process, we no longer can access our curious brain nearly as much as we need to. And so if the organization or as a leader were you instituting really kind of a fear factor, so to speak, it automatically starts limiting our ability to innovate. And so what we find through our research is leaders with the abundance mentality or gratitude mentality develop and promote both intellectual and business curiosity which is all about innovation. So if we create and try to lead through fear, and many of us have, have been probably with leaders who tend to use fear as a, uh, a motivator, um, and I use that term loosely, it, it really doesn't motivate anyone to do anything except potentially look for a new job, but that fear does really limit our ability to use our curious brain. And that limiting factor then flips that switch to go from creativity and innovation to survival. And that, as you can well tell, is not something that's going to help us you know, do innovation and be successful, both as a leader and as an individual being led. The next thing I'd like to talk about is inspiration. And inspiration is really about a couple things. One, you have to increase your trust and transparency to ins inspire people. If they don't trust you or you aren't transparent, um, then it really is hard to inspire 
anything from anyone. Um, and sometimes you'll see this in organizations, and we do it when we you know work with organizations and leadership perspective, is we have leaders kind of create these false narratives um, when uncertainty is obvious. So don't worry, everything's going to be great. I'm not suggesting that you wind up, you know, going the opposite extreme, but basically when everything is apparent around you um, and you're still saying as a leader, hey, we're good, don't worry about it, everything's going to be great. We've all seen the, you know, pronouncements inside organizations where, hey, don't worry, it's a little bit of a rough spot, don't, no one's going to lose their job. Then within one month, we see the layoff notices, you know, in the paper that, oh my God, they're cutting back X number of percent of people. So that's important. One, give assurance to success, but be realistic as to the journey. So here's where we're going. We're going to be successful. And, oh, by the way, here's the journey. Here's the realistic of how it's going to happen. And then lastly is over-communicate. A lot of times, you know, managers tend to go into their offices or into their shells instead of communicating. Great leaders over-communicate. Great leaders talk continuously about what, what's happening. Um, it's a it's an older reference, but it's one I, I'm still wildly fascinated by. Um, if you remember, obviously, we had a president a long time ago who was also a general in World War II, Dwight Eisenhower. And Dwight Eisenhower had never fought in any military action in his career, whereas every general that he commanded, think about this, Patton, Montgomery, all these different generals from all these allies, had all fought in World War I. They did not respect him. And the crazy thing is, is when you look at his history, his oral history of what he did, over communication, assurance of success, and trust and transparency was 100% what drove his success. It wasn't about his strategic vision, which was excellent, but it was about how he created trust and transparency amongst all these different allies. Um, Second thing is, is to, to really kind of inoculate your team with a vision. And a vision isn't necessarily what the company's vision is because those are nice and they're easy to do, but it's like, what's your great vision? What, how are you gonna weather these short-term turbulences? How are you gonna win the long-term and how are you gonna win the short-term, both? And what do those things mean? And then really positioning that uncertainty in anything. And if you think about where we are right now in life, it is all about uncertainty. Uh, everything in, in our world is uncertain right now. So, but isn't uncertainty truly an opportunity, an opportunity for success? And those are the things that we want to, to really focus on. So I had a question from, from Wayne while we're doing this. And you know, how fine is the line between overcommunication and micromanagement? Great question. Overcommunication and micromanagement are kind of two different things in, in, from my perspective. Overcommunication is I'm telling you about what's going on, why it's going on. Micromanagement is when I sit down with you and say, okay, um, show me all of the sales calls you made or show me what things you've done in the last week or, oh, by the way, I'd love a log of all of your activities over the course of the next three weeks as to what you're doing. That's micromanagement. Overcommunication is, you know, committing to people, keeping them informed, and really giving them information, and also listening in terms of what what it means and how we do it. So the next one we talked about, so we've talked about innovation, we've talked about inspiration. Let's talk about change. And navigation of change isn't what I like to say is crisis change. That's very different. Um, this is really about how do you create certainty, which might be insert uncertainty. Many organizations create, you know, very consistent goals and expectations, both short term and long term. Unfortunately, sometimes the organizations will switch those around. And so they start creating uncertainty because they're switching goals or switching expectations. And if it's not communicated what that means in connecting the dots for people, it makes it very hard for them to understand. So a couple of things to do that. One is set those consistent goals, shorten the outcome horizon. A lot of times organizations talk about a year, two years, five-year plans. Sometimes in that uncertainty, we shorten the outcome horizon to next 30 days, next 60 days, next 90 days. And how do we make sure we don't have competing outcomes? And what that means is simply this. 
I was with an organization recently that basically every person had to make sure that their information was put into Salesforce. That was important. That was like, literally, you could lose your job if you didn't do that. They were also working with a customer experience model, which was how do we make the customer experience better? Well, I think as all of you sit here, you know darn well that Salesforce or CRM is not in the customer's operating reality. They really don't care about your internal reporting. They care about the experience and how they're being responded to. A competing outcome is someone who has to answer a phone call and take care of a customer as opposed to the CRM. So now they're in this competing outcome of, boy, if I don't in, in, if I forget to input this information why I'm doing it right now, then I might lose my job, but I'm also now trying to create a great customer experience. Those are competing outcomes. And to do that, what we have to often do as leaders is reduce the process constraints. What are some of the things that are constraining our people from moving forward? And lastly, what we have to do is make sure we are not leading with bias. And sometimes uh, leaders and managers both lead with a bias. They have a bias against an individual or against the team, against the product, against the result. And we have to make sure that we are not leading with bias. So a um, couple of things to also remember is um, you have to allow for risk from your team members. So how do you create that confidence and agility is allow your team members to take risks. Obviously, calculated risks are important, not just crazy flyers, but how do we allow them to, to risk share? Um, how do we make sure we got the team in the right role? So how do we make sure that the right people are in the right seat? And how do we make sure that we allocate our resources in a way that helps us be successful? So those are kind of some things when it comes to navigate change. Um, I'm going to stop here for a second because there was a couple um, questions, and so I'll kind of cover those uh, right now. So uh, one of them was reported, they report to a VP, um, and they're getting multiple questions um, from another individual. So you're getting basically, I'm reporting to someone else, but I'm having a kind of interested party or someone with an ancillary reporting position giving me a lot of tasks and, and, and kind of wanting to meet and those types of things. So here's what I would like to, to say, and which is a great question, thank you, is that's where as a leader or an individual is we have to um, make sure that we um, bring both in. So it's not like one or the other, it's both because ultimately the person who you report to is going to you know, dictate what happens in the decision-making process. And so by bringing them both together, what you wind up doing is getting collaboration between them, which is, which is probably not happening quite honestly, and two, then help set priorities for success as we go forward. So thank you for the, the question and it was, appreciate that very much. So let's talk about your likability. And as part of this, I like to kind of, you know, get in the middle of this. If you think about innovation, inspiration, and change, one of the things that goes with this is the likability in terms of how people view you. And um, I often tell people, you know, what does likability mean? It doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to win the day, so to speak, on everything. But what you're going to do is people respect you and they want to talk out, talk to you. They reach out to you. And that becomes critical as we move into the next piece. What we're going to talk about is development. And there are leadership essentials. So how do we engage training programs, challenge our team members, provide earned freedom? Sometimes as leaders, we forget to do that. Provide earned freedom. Create opportunities and really kind of create leadership dynamics within the whole team meaning we allow other people to do that. Some leadership challenges to do this. I have never met an organization that time, treasure, and desire don't influence how those outcomes happen. Our job is to work with our leaders to figure out what's the best way to engage our team and develop them. Lack of development is also one of the number one job turnover rates out there. So how do we do that becomes critical to our success. Um, and, you know, how do we create a, a development culture? Uh, the, 
you know, organizations that just have the just do the job, not awesome. Um, and simply the reason that is, is because, well, um, people will get burned out. So um, one of the questions came up as we were sitting here going through, what does earned freedom mean? Thank you for the, the question. Earned freedom is when people perform well, that you give them more opportunities to develop themselves, to help do things more on their own, to problem solve more on their own, to give them the latitude to make decisions. Um, and sometimes we give people latitude to make decisions and they haven't earned that freedom, they make bad decisions potentially. Earned freedom allows them to make decisions within constraints that then you know, allow them to develop and continue to be better at what they do. It also sends an incredible message to the rest of your team, which is simply this. If you earn the ability to be successful, you will earn the right to get more freedom to make more decisions. So, and, and a part of that kind of looks like this, is this is what your relationship starts looking like as you go through the first four elements. Um, it's what we call an, an interdependent relationship or known as an interdependent relationship. It has four main pieces of this. Trust, credibility, rapport, respect. Do you want to know if your likability score is high? Ask yourself, do I have these things when it comes to my relationship with the individuals on my team or the individuals north of me? In other words, if I think about bosses or other C-level people within the organization, and not just my direct you know, kind of reporting level, but further up. What position am I in? And that interdependency becomes really critical. No one, including our own children, do not like this dependent subordinate relationship. If you have young children, I always like to say, uh, from you know, born till about 13, obviously born to five or six, you can't even leave them because, well, they would perish. They aren't going to be able to control their own food, their own all those things that are essential in Maslow's hierarchy of needs of survival. But as they get closer to 13, 14, um, you become nothing but the man or woman keeping them down and they want more They want more say in the relationship. They want more say in the process. And that same thing is true with our own team members. It's like, have we created an interdependent relationship? Lastly, the part that I really love talking about is the concept of connect and engage. And it comes down to this, um, lead in the language of your team members, not yours. How we are motivated, how we deal with things, is each one of us is very different. We have 120 some people on here right now. Every one of us are not the same. So if I'm a rah, rah, go get them, take the hill person, and you are not, and that's the only language I lead in, uh, the chances are I'm not motivating you or connecting with you in a way that makes sense. So have some common ground, that professional and personal show respect for others and have authenticity. I, I love this word authenticity. And especially as we look more and more into the future with multi-generations in the workforce, being real is critical to your success. Integrity, the things you say, the things you do are, are rooted in integrity and you're decisive. No one likes anything that, uh, doesn't talk about decisiveness in terms of making a good decision. Well thought out, good decision and sticking with it. Talked about EQ, talked about inclusiveness and bringing the team together, even those that you think are performing or underperforming, making sure that they're included, have that vision, the vigor, empathy, build those relationships. And lastly, it came up with a question, what, you know, how does active listening support essentials in leadership? I think the best leadership lesson, uh, sorry, the best leadership lesson I ever received was actually from my grandmother when she was, you know, watching over me as a young child. She said, Jeffrey, you have two ears and one mouth. You should best use them in proportion. And I like to think about that a lot when I'm in leadership roles is active listening. Listening first becomes critical to my success and your success and our success than speaking. And a lot of leaders like to lead with their voice as opposed to uh, leading with their ears. And that becomes critical. Another uh, mentor of mine a long time ago used to say something simple to this, is people don't know care how much you know unless they know how much you care. And so if your team doesn't believe that you actually care about them, 
they don't care what you know because they're more focused on the fact you don't like them or you aren't connected to them. So let's talk about a second poll question here. Um, this is going to be a relatively quick one. So D, I'm going to have you go quick because I don't want to run out of time here to finish on a couple of things here. But um, what are the top reasons why people leave their job? Toxic company culture, uh, compensation, uh, poor management or manager, lack of health, uh, healthy work-life benefit. D, if you could open up that poll. And as you think about these things, um, you know, it's often said that, you know, people always leave because of compensation. And the reality is they really don't. They leave for many other reasons. So I kind of gave you a tip. Compensation probably is not number one. <laughs> Sorry for that delay. I lost it in the sea of windows. No worries. So as, uh, as Dee's opening that up and you're taking a moment to go ahead and answer that question, I'm gonna just give you a quick 30 seconds here as we kind of think about into where we are now and where we're going, uh, a couple things. Um, one, I'm gonna talk about what I like to call the bees of leadership. And these are things that as you think about who you are as a leader, these become very critical to your success. So I'm gonna skip past that real quick. While you guys are voting and D will make it uh, go forward, I want to talk about the B's of leadership. And the B's of leadership are something that I try to remember uh, and actually have a little piece of this on my desk here all the time. It says, a leader, be bold, be positive energy, be positive attitude, uh, look and, you know, at why, not how. Be passionate about your team, be asking for input, be timely in your decisions. You know, one of the greatest difficulties I think people have more and more is dealing with leaders who do not make decisions. They need more data. Well, sooner or later, all the data in the world isn't going to get you where you want to get to. So think about, you know, the decision. Be involved. Be engaged. Uh, excuse my language, but I mean this sincerely. Be giving a shit about people. If you don't care, why should they care? Be the cultural and mental well-being of your team. Be those things, those become the critical piece of how we go forward. And if you think about, you know, what this really comes down to is how to be a leader in the flow, in the flow of the action and the flow of the game. And so it's it's interesting. Um, I see the results here, and I'm going to squeak back here real quick. Um, through the, the research that we've done is what we found is, one, uh, culture and poor manager or management are the top two reasons. So if you think about both of those are human asset time frame. I probably skewed compensation a little bit too much, but compensation is in there, but then also a healthy work balance. But if you think about you know, four managers, and it's been said over and over and over again for a thousand years, people don't leave companies, they leave leaders, they leave managers. I would submit to you, people generally don't leave leaders, they leave managers. So with that, I'm going to kind of turn it over. One of the things I always like to tell people is don't be afraid to, um, you know, invest in yourself or your team. We have a virtual leadership uh, program coming up in uh, June, and I'm offering a $500 off if you scan this code. And uh, if you actually scan the code and talk about uh, that you actually were in attendance. So this is the secret code. If you say you were in attendance and you'll chat with uh, Brenna Nugent and Brenna will actually give you another $500 off. So you can actually get up to $1,000 off in doing this virtual leadership program. It also comes with some cult, uh, coaching. And I think it's really a, a great investment in yourself and your organization. So don't be afraid to uh, connect with us at uh, Carew.com and uh, we will reach out to you. So that's it. I talked about be bold. And then I would just think, ask you with close with a couple of questions that I'd ask yourself uh, as you go forward is what has the biggest impact on your company's performance and ultimately yours? And it's leaders. Pretty obvious. And lastly, I'll leave you with this and being in a leadership position. When you promote the wrong people, you really begin to lose the best people. With that, I'm going to open it up to questions, and Dee, I will leave it to you. Okay. Uh, 
I don't think we answered this one. Uh, Dennis asked, in your experience, how does active listening support the essentials of leadership? Um, that was actually my two ears, one mouth. Okay. <laughs> uh, I can't, I can't, don't think you get any more active than that in terms of, you know, um, you know, listen first. As a leader, you should always listen again, because people don't necessarily care um, what you have to say. If they're there to talk to you, they want you to hear them and to be listened to. And then listening has a, a unique um, impact. It makes people feel cared for. And I think that's really what's important as a leader. Um, you can do that. And I will flash the QR code back up here. So I'll leave that up so you all can grab that. Um, give you the most important thing. Here's the money off. And just mentioned to Brenna, you heard about me and talked about us on trainingindustry.com. And so, um, but if you think about it, it's like really important from a leadership perspective to listen. And a lot of times, unfortunately, leaders prefer to talk because they think they're the smartest people in the room. And after a lot of experience, I can tell you, I've never been the smartest person in any room ever. There's always going to be someone smarter or in a different area. So it's always good to get everyone's input, I think. Um, we had a comment earlier that uh, self-awareness was integral to the first group of traits that you mentioned. And I was thinking that probably that's a key to success in any venture, but uh, is there anything yeah. you'd like to comment on that? Um, yeah. And I think, you know, there's a million assessments out there, you know, in terms of how to do that. Um, but I think understanding what motivates you is really critical. And there's a couple different assessments that do that. One's the strength uh, deployment indicator, which helps you understand how you're motivated, but also gives you tips that probably not everyone's motivated the same way you are when things are going well, but also, you know, teaches you how to handle conflict. And obviously not all of us handle conflict, you know, the same. And basically they're effectively well-written three stages of conflict. The first stage is we're concerned about the problem, we're concerned about ourselves, and we're concerned about other people. The next one, uh, other people we don't really care about, we're concerned about the problem and ourselves. And finally, the third stage, we're just concerned about ourselves. And so literally, that's something um, that we need to you know, understand because how I handle conflict may be very different than how one of my colleagues handles uh, conflict. And so to me, that's really critical. I'm a person when I handle conflict personally, I tried my best to make sure the relationship stays intact. Where if I'm dealing with someone who's their first instinct is let's fight about it. Um, you know, and I'm trying to make sure the relationship's intact and they want to, you know, fight me about it. It's like, okay, I've got to understand how to access them in a way that makes, you know, good sense for both of us. Mm -hmm. Would you mind repeating what the the name of that assessment was for us? Yes. It's uh, through a company called Core Strengths. And it's the Strength Deployment Indicator SDI. Um, you can take it online. They they have it. It's a it's a great assessment. You get instantaneously feed instantaneous feedback with lots of information about yourself. And like I said, you get information about yourself, but also all the other styles and how you interface with them. Which as a leader gives you a pretty good clue of oh, well, I'll use D and I. D was my boss, and I'm looking at this. I go oh, D's this way, I'm this way, I, we've got to figure out how to talk the same language. And uh, I like to say sometimes there's a lot of leaders who are you know, trying to speak French and everyone's listening in Spanish. It usually doesn't go so well. Yeah. Or I found working with cross-functional teams that sometimes you're saying the same thing, but because you're, it's almost like you're saying it in an opposite way, it's hard to understand each other. So it's always interesting when you realize, oh, we're, we're saying the same thing. It's a, uh, you know, I have an undergrad in accounting, which is I've never was an accountant in my life, but for like six months, but I have an undergrad in accounting. And, you know, that's very black and white. And what I found is then I went to, to grad school and I would, you know, came strategy and marketing, which is, you know, live life in the gray. And so when you when you work with people who are very black and white, especially in cross functional teams, they see things very, you know, you know, almost like a, you know, like a programmer does. It's a, it's a one or a zero, you know, it's not, there's no, there's no one, no halves, no, you know, nothing. Whereas, so trying to communicate within organizations where you've got very technical people and very creative people together, it makes, you know, you really have to work well to do that. 
And that we are right at a uh, quarter till. Is there any last words you'd like to leave us with? Um, will this information on getting the discount in the uh, leadership course be included with the post event information? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. And I will very quickly put uh, my email address in here. It's really easy. So you can uh, find me anytime, any place at jeff at crew.com. And I will also just put my mobile number in there. So if anyone ever has a question, wants to shoot me a text, feel free to do that. I'm very responsive and uh, very open about what I do and how I do it. And can't thank the people for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for doing that and giving me some time to talk a little bit about my favorite topic, leadership. And you can always catch me at Jeff at crew.com or my phone number on the on the, the chat room. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. This has been super interesting. I, I feel like I, I'm going to go take that uh, assessment and see what my conflict resolution style is. <laughs> great. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. I hope you come back. All right. Um, up next for our final session of the day, we will be joined by Ellen Gomes, and she is joining us from Torch for the session, Unlock the Potential of Your Managers. So we'll take one more quick 15 minute break. I will close out this session and look for you at the top of the hour in our next one. Thank you.